We're going to talk about this concept called mind mapping, which um, some people are super familiar with and others have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. So um, that's a map. It's not of my mind, but it's <laughs> the idea. It's really actually a super simple idea, and it's a really great exercise, whether you're doing a one-day shoot or, or the project. And the idea is basically to do this, is to take the assignment, the concept, and build on it. And so this is an example of a story about beer. And super easy. And there are software programs that do this and books about this. So this is like really like basic, basic. But basically, this is both for, can be for your overall idea, can be for something specific that you want to kind of get to, and it can also be uh, for your shot list. Like, how do, what do I need to photograph to talk about X? So beer, chosen topic. And I literally did this in, in 15 minutes. And you just kind of start to like free flow. Like, what does beer mean to you? OK, so bars, brewery, how does it affect all these different things, culture, economy? And then you start to go off into all of these different places. So you start to see, like, there's this, the overall story of beer. And you can do all these things if you're doing like a huge kind of National Geographic story. But maybe like you really want to kind of zoom into just the effect of, of beer on teens. And then that means like you need to photograph teens at school, teens at a party, teens at home, so on. And you start to kind of just like start to figure out all these different things. And it, it's such an easy and super helpful exercise. I mean, it really can, can take you in so many different ways. And there are times also that I've found when I've done this where I start off with an idea and I start mind mapping. And then all of a sudden, I get to a point where like, wait a minute. The place that I just got to on the mind map is actually the story. That's where I want to be. And then all of a sudden, like, you do another mind map from that place. But you know, it's kind of going, this is along the same lines of you know, you're doing this simultaneously with your research, or maybe you're doing this before the research, and it helps you bring yourself to where you want to research. But it's, it's, like, it's a super, super simple exercise that you can, you know, in 15 minutes, you can all of a sudden feel like going from a story that you have absolutely no idea how to start to, to address to like actually having instructions. And one of the things that for photographers, at least for myself, like you come up with an idea, but then it's just like it's, it's unwieldy. And you don't like, how do I do it? Or how do I do it differently? And like, how do you take that first step? It's always like that first step is the hardest step. And then once you kind of get moving, things start to break, break down and enable you to kind of see it much more clearly. So the mind map exercise is really really a great way uh, and a great tool to be able to kind of help you really focus and see what you want to do. And then also, like when you start listing it, like when you really get to the subject that you want to do, and you have a shot list. It's like, these are the things that I, I absolutely ne need to address visually or address an interview or however you're going to present your story. But these things, these are the really key elements of, of the story. And you'll always have that. And so you have. You have these instructions that you're giving to yourself, like this is what these elements I need to do to, get, uh, to make a successful story. And then when you go out into the field and you start to do them, then you're going to find they're going to lead you to other places. So this is not like the end of it. This is like the structure and the beginning. But it's not like once you do it, that's it. If there are other places that it's going to take you to when you're working on your story, then that's, then that's where you go. Ken, any, any questions about this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's so cool to hear you talk about some of these actionable things that we can do when we're lost. Um, and the mind map is brilliant. So you talked about um, when you're thinking about how to start creating a story and then using those that for shot lists, which I also think is brilliant. What else might you use the mind map for through the process of a particular story? Well, I think it's this idea of just you know, continuing to be interacting with your story in, in real time and going, going with your flow. So I didn't mention this earlier, but you know, there's the benefits of the multi-platform presentation of thinking about it. But at the same time, you can't pre-think too much. Right? You as a photographer have to be flexible enough to have a structure, which can come from the multi-platforming uh, multi or the mind mapping. But at the same time, you need to be able to adjust in real time to whatever you're seeing. So like I talked about Gilles Perez and how he came 
uh, to Bosnia with this idea about the book in terms of the structure, but at the same time, he was flexible enough in his photography that if he was going to be led in a different way, he would allow that to happen. So, you know, one of the things for myself as a photographer, I have an idea or I get a call from an editor, I want you to go off and do this or that, and then immediately I start thinking about, you know, you start thinking about what are those pictures going to look like? Like, what, and what, what's like the best photograph that I can get from this situation? And that can be super helpful. And, and you should do that. But you have to be really, really careful that you don't take it to the point where that's the only thing you're looking for. Because if you do that, there could be amazing things happening in front of you. But because you weren't thinking about that, you totally miss it. So it's always like in many of these things, it's kind of finding that balance between having structure and an idea, but also being open enough to like, you know, to interpret whatever's happening in front of you. Interesting to think about, do you re-mind map or do you kind of change that, the actual mind map, go back and redo it as you are finding and discovering new aspects of the story? Yeah, absolutely. Because so I think this exercise can continuously uh, benefit you and can happen. And so if you start shifting in different directions and maybe you have to go back and look at your mind map and go, you know, this is not, maybe I've learned more about it and I need to, to do it in a different direction. And just, it's another tool to have in your arsenal to use to help you really be able to maximize your time and take advantage of what's happening in front of you in terms of the story. Cool, and then reiterating again, a comment came in, can't the mind map also serve as a rough outline for putting together some of the images after they're captured, building that final story? So kind of returning back to that. Absolutely, it's, it's good for that. And of course, it's also going to be good, we're going to talk about it in a bit, about helping your pitch letter. Right, because you're going to use, you're going to translate this into actual sentences. You're going to put the words together and say, like, okay, we're going to spend time with teenagers at school, in their social lives, and so on, and explore the aspects of beer culture or whatever. So these are going to also, the mind map is also going to help you with with your pitch letter as well, obviously, as as the photography. So, so I'm just going to show you guys a short film, kind of using kind of both the, the mind mapping idea and also the multi-platform. So I told you guys I went to, to Haiti. I did uh, a story on the earthquake. Then I did the book and the exhibition. And then I continued to go back uh, working in Haiti. Uh, I was working primarily for People magazine, which had done uh, probably the most stories, surprisingly enough, the most stories of any magazine about Haiti after the earthquake. And I went back for the cholera epidemic. And, and I spent a lot of time uh, working with a writer. And um, he was really, really affected by, by what he was seeing. And he and his wife had decided uh, that they wanted to, to do something more than, than journalism. They wanted to have like real, like a, amazing impact. So they decided to adopt two, two Haitian kids um, after, after the earthquake. And so people asked me to, um, to document uh, their adoption process. Uh, and they asked me first to do, just to do a still story, to do a, a photo essay. And as I was spending more time, I kept telling people, like, you know, this is like, there's more here. We should do more with this. We should really do, we should do a film also. And it took, like, months and months of convincing people to invest the money into doing a film uh, on it. But eventually they said yes. And so after two years, and they finally um, were able to adopt their family. And so this is, uh, this is the piece uh, that came out of that. A major earthquake shook the Caribbean nation of Haiti late today. It hit just 14 miles in the capital city, Port-au-Prince. Oh, no food, no water, no nothing. Le vieux! Go love, go life for everybody. I was covering the earthquake and I knew that I wanted to do something after seeing all the, the trouble that was going on here, all the suffering. We figured we would donate or get involved with some charitable organization. But then he kept going back to Haiti. The more times I was sent back here and the more times I saw all these children in orphanages, 
I thought, you know, maybe this is what we should do. Maybe it's time to adopt. All these infants that were just being left at this place, their women were coming there and having babies and figuring, well, these people can take care of the baby better than I can. And so my wife and I talked about it and we went on and on and, and there were a lot of discussions about it and we thought, yeah, let's go ahead and adopt a child from Haiti. And that was the beginning of, of how we got here. I think that the kids are excited, but I think they're also terrified. I think that, that goes for all of us. We did have a lot of times of stress, a lot of times that we, you know, we wouldn't, weren't seeing eye to eye. A lot of times we were angry with the whole system for taking so long. So we got very impatient and, and it, was, it was a really difficult time to really have the faith that they would come home one day. Dear Lord, thank you so much that everybody made it home safe and that we're together as a family. They don't have a concept of how the average American kid lives. This morning, I caught her just kind of staring at the whole pile of toys. Their first day being ripped away, I thought that there would be more um, pining away for what they've lost. Um, and there was nothing like that. I'm happy because I woke up today. I'm happy because there's still blood in my veins. I'm happy because flower pots drop every day. But none has fallen on me yet. I'm happy because. All right, everybody, just put on your shoes. Definitely as time has gone on, we've kind of honed the routine about how we get the day-to-day -day things done. I like that I'm using up all my energy every day doing something that I think is genuinely worthwhile. Hands on your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And say their name for me. Whisper it. Shout it. already a strong family. I would say this just expanded the scope of what our family is and what our family does. I don't think I will look back on this part of my life and think that I wasted it. We have finally gotten to a place where our family can be a little bit mobile. It was also nice because I realized that I was starting to feel the same way about watching these kids discover the world around them that I had felt about my biological kids as they were discovering the world around them. And I think it was a really good bonding experience. Mia and Ezra, 
that's probably the thing that has made them the most surprising. It's almost like they don't remember life before the kids came home. We were so worried about them and we really didn't need to be. We have a family of eight different people with eight different personalities who've all come together as the parents, Emma and I, are trying to steer a ship with eight people rowing in different directions. I hope that we can be the parents that they deserve. I hope that they can look back at this time as the change that made their life as good as possible. This is for life, and we are their family forever. So that was like a good example, actually, of, of my mapping because of such a on the fly or continuously because the story kept changing and kept going and had these different elements. And so especially when adding the motion side, then the magazine started saying like, okay, we need the parents talking about this because this is an important subject and we need to illustrate that and show that. And so it was kind of like this constantly uh, organic and, and, growing, and growing experience. Uh, and so it's again like kind of being very nimble and being very you know, willing to, to not always stick. Like originally the idea was like it was gonna be a few months, they are gonna come home, it was gonna be like this, and then it wound up lasting more than two years and, and all these different elements that came, came into play. And that's, you know, those are your skills as, as journalists primarily, but obviously also as visual storytellers. So do you guys have any more, any questions more about my mapping or? Can no. I? <laughs> Ron, first of all, thank you for sharing that. Um, Captured Grace by Aaron says, I'm in tears. Thank you for telling the story. It's so beautiful. And a question about, this is from Swanee uh, Bacandano. When doing video and photographing at the same time, how do you manage to see what would work on stills and what would work on video? And do you shoot both at the same time? That's, that's a great question. And this is something that all of us are, are dealing with, especially with this concept of, of the one man band. And like, oh, well, you've got a camera that shoots video, so go off and shoot video, and then shoot some stills, and, and then do some audio, and then do this, and then do that, and light this, and light that. And, and this, is, this is a lot, right? And so there are times where you have to actually say to the client, like, no, like, this is not, like, for your budget and your time period, that I can give it to you, but it's not, the quality is not going to be there. Uh, and I think that it's amount of understanding like what you need to do. So on, in this particular um, assignment, I was able to say to people like, you need to give me more time. I'm going to dedicate days that are primarily going to be motion and days that are primarily going to be stills. And I think that often can be incredibly helpful if you're going to be the only person doing the project. But remember earlier we were talking about collaboration and collaboration is really, really key when you're doing motion. And the first thing with collaboration in motion is, is sound. Photographers and filmmakers themselves that are only doing film, sound is one of the biggest problems and biggest issues. Like if your sound is not good, it doesn't matter how good your visuals are, you're gonna have serious problems. So it's an, if you have the opportunity, and this is starting to become a little bit more acceptable, where editorial clients and other people are starting to understand this concept, hire, get a budget to hire a sound person. It is incredibly liberating when you're shooting motion where you don't have to worry about sound at the same time. So if you have the ability to do that, you should try to do that for sure. If you don't, make sure you really understand how to use your gear, how to use sound, whether you're using labs, the mics, whatever system you're using, whether you're using DSLRs or the other cameras, there are, there are all these different aspects that are important. Um, but I think what is starting to happen um, is that clients are starting to appreciate, uh, because of the power of video, actually in some places more powerful than stills on the web, they want to produce good video. It's not everywhere and certainly not the majority, but it's starting to become so. So for instance, on this project with people, 
and this is like the third film that I've done, done for them, I said, okay, you don't want to pay for sound, but I need to pay for an editor. I need an editor. I mean, I can edit, I can sit there and, and do it, but it's, it'd be great to work with somebody that has a different eye, that's looking at it in a different way, coming from not being within the, the story, but from outside. And that's the best way to do it. And they said, okay, we'll have a budget for an editor. And that made, I think, a huge, for me, made a huge difference. Um, so there are multiple things to take into conversation because more and more you're going to be asked to do both stills and, and motion. And for the most part, even though it's starting to change and you can extract, especially with when you're shooting 4K video, you can extract still, stills from the video, there's still a lot of limitations uh, on doing that. So still photography is still going to have its role and a very important role, plus the way the mind works and so on. But in terms of when you're talking to the editors, you have to really say, like, I'm very happy. This is my idea um, for motion. It's my idea for stills. Maybe we'll use both together like we did in this. And there are other pieces that I've done that are motion only. And there are other pieces like the Yugoslavia piece you saw earlier, which is just stills and audio. Um, so again, it's kind of going to that idea of like, how do you want that to come out? And then proposing the best project uh, scenario for that client that works for that client and for that audience. That's also really important to know that what works for People Magazine might not work for Geographic, what works for Geographic might not work for Vice. So understanding your clients and, and their desire and what they're doing with motion and stills is also really, really important. And it, it's, a very, um, it's a very fluid and live conversation and something that most of you are probably already dealing with. And it's important to understand your capabilities, make sure your client understands it, and to also understand um, what budgets are and what you're willing, and what you're willing to do. And, and I think that hopefully for all of us, as clients are, are appreciating all the different ways that we can tell stories more and more, that they're going to have at the least expenses, the budget for the expenses to do so.